Thanks, Rob. Thanks, everybody, for uh, being here today. It's been uh, really awesome being a part of uh, Pinball Expo. Uh, the pinball side of it uh, is something that uh, we've tried since the when we opened. We tried it, and it was very difficult for us. And uh, we've mostly focused on the video game side. Uh, we opened the arcade back in 2010, August 13th, and uh, it's it's been since we opened. We opened with 140 machines, and uh, now we've grown to have uh, currently 667 machines. Uh, we're the largest arcade in the world now, which is uh, it's been a lot of a uh, lot of growth over the last few years. Uh, back in 2010, uh, when we opened. Uh, pretty much the only time you heard about arcades were when they were closing. And uh, what really inspired us to open the arcade was we would go to other venues and uh, look at their the arcade machines. And so many of them were in just disrepair. And uh, back initially, uh, we opened with Galloping Ghost Productions, which had focused on making video games. And the thought was to make games for the arcade. And it really forced us to look at the arcade industry in a very different way than I think most places were looking at it. I think a lot of the arcades at the time were very complacent and uh, just kind of doing their thing, opening, having their machines on. Most of the places that uh, we went to, their machines were just in bad disrepair, uh, even offering to fix them. Uh, nobody really wanted them fixed. And it was really unfortunate as myself, I, I lived in arcades growing up. Uh, there were so many great games and it was, every trip to the arcade was memorable and special. And looking back on it now, uh, it was all stuff that I took in and used it to make what would eventually become the Galloping Ghost Arcade. Um, since in the last few years and even Early on, uh, there was a tremendous interest in people seeing what we were doing. And uh, it quickly turned into uh, almost like a resurgence of the arcade scene. Like it had always been there, but there's a lot of people, even after the first year, uh, we started to see people who were like, wow, that's really cool. You're doing it at a large scale level with 100, 140 machines. And uh, maybe I could open an arcade too. And that's been one of the big things that's been so satisfying about opening the arcade is uh, helping other arcades open. Um, currently, we've helped about 27 arcades open uh, since we opened. And right now, we're talking with about 175 other arcades worldwide that are interested in opening an arcade. And well, when we opened, it was uh, just kind of a, as we went along, like we were, we were making a lot of this stuff up. Uh, and fortunately, we made a lot of smart and right decisions that has allowed us to keep growing and become what we are. Uh, it's, it's been so tremendous to see players travel in from all over the world. Um, Australia, Japan, China, um, Germany, like to get people to travel to come play arcade games is just, it's an unbelievable feeling. Um, it's something that we, we never went into it expecting that to be a part of it. Uh, but it's, it's definitely been one of the most satisfying things to see. Uh, we've had, just to be able to watch from all aspects that, that we have, uh, like we, we do so many events at the arcade and so, so many of them involve industry people. Um, I remember the first time we had the actors from Mortal Kombat to the arcade and the first time we had Jeff Lee to the arcade, the creator of Qbert. And that letting players see the industry people and help uh, generate a deeper interest in not just um, the games themselves but the people that worked on them. And it, the way that people have reacted to it has just been unbelievable, uh, which is one of the main reasons why we love going to shows like this is that there's so, you get to meet so many tremendous people that are just as passionate as, as can be about 
arcade gaming and pinball and uh, it's, it's just such an amazing community. Um, making it all work, we, uh, of the places that we've helped open, we've seen so many open and close and even with, given our insight, uh, some people just think it's going to be an, an easy walk in the park, just put some arcade machines, some pinball machines on the, on the floor, invite people in and that's it. And it, it, is, it is honestly so far from that. Uh, it is just a tremendous amount of work. It's, uh, for me, it's seven days a week, and I wouldn't, wouldn't change a minute of it. Uh, I love being at the arcade. I love fixing machines, bringing them back to life. So it's uh, just an absolutely tremendous feeling to be able to take a game that people have never, in most cases, a lot of them people have never even seen or heard of before, and present them in a way uh, that everybody, they do. They travel from all over to come and enjoy them. So uh, one of the things we, we definitely wanted to put out there is that we, we've had entire uh, panels like this where we talk about how to open an arcade, uh, what you do behind it, and uh, the marketing of it, and what, what games you should be looking for. And it's, it's definitely not what most people think it is. Uh, most people think you go right for the, the classics and the staples and the stuff everybody knows. Uh, and those are the stuff, they, there's so many different ways to look at it. And there really is no right or wrong way, but you do kind of see some key things that work better than others. Um, for us, we had a little bit of everything and it really, was geared towards the hardcore player. Uh, so many arcades look at it and they decide, oh, I want to be a place for kids and they go with redemption games and a mix of arcade or video games and redemption. Or they want to go with more um, an older crowd and have alcohol. And for us, we always looked at it as uh, the casual player and the hardcore player. And the casual player, there's an abundance of them. They're everywhere. Uh, everybody will play video games, but we wanted to go after the people that wanted, would travel, the, the people that were just so in love with these games that they would jump on a plane and fly from halfway around the world. And talking with so many people that actually operated arcades and the people who designed these games and everything, it was such a, uh, we were told out of the box, like, oh, this is, this is not going to work, not in today's day and age. And, most people were, were giving us only a few months. Uh, I remember talking with Larry DeMar, and the first time he had come in, and he's like, oh, you're, you seem really passionate about this, but I, I just don't see this working. I don't think that people are going to keep coming here. And it was, it was a crushing thing. Like, Larry had worked on so many amazing games, and it, it was kind of, uh, to me, that was the one time I was like, wow, would this ever not work and I, I was confident that it would because I knew how I couldn't find any place to, to play arcade games. So I thought there's got to be other people like me that they're going to just love this. They're going to eat it up. Um, and it, it turned out to be, it, it, it worked. It, uh, we opened, um, again back when we opened we had, we we're successful right out of the box. Um, we were profitable after about eight months. Um, now we pull about 80,000 people a year to the arcade and uh, with every expansion it, it just keeps growing and growing and again it's it's so much attributed to the passion of the people that are that love these games and at the Galloping Ghost Arcade because we look at it from the, the hardcore standpoint and with that that brings taking players into account and taking what the players desires and wants and, and needs are at such a, a high level and the industry people and wanting to show off and give the history of it. We've really grown into the position of uh, where we kind of usher people through the, the journey of arcade gaming and it's, it's, uh, that, it's really kind of the total package and that's the one big difference, I think, between us and so many of the other arcades is that uh, it's still, like every game is important, every player is important, every developer is important, and to showcase that at a high level 
is what has really made it successful and continue to grow. Um, within the arcade also, I have a, just a rabid compulsion and I uh, should probably go get some uh, psychological help for my collecting addiction, which everybody seems to, I hide it amongst it's a business, but uh, it's, it in itself, continuously putting new games on the arcade floor has been um, such a tremendous draw to get people to come out and see the newest games. And as people have found out about us and decided that so many people within the community have tried to help us grow, uh, again, especially industry people, uh, getting creators to come in and uh, work on projects that people never even got to see. Most recently, uh, with Galloping Ghost Productions, we teamed up with Brian Cullen, who was the guy behind Rampage, and he did the art for Spy Hunter and Xenophobe, Arch Rivals, Pigskin. He worked on all these great games. And uh, he had worked on a game back in 1984. It was supposed to be a Laserdisc game. And it was, they had filmed it, they, it was supposed to be a B-horror movie spoof, uh, a lot of uh, tongue-in-cheek jokes, a lot of puns. And uh, they filmed it all and then promptly canceled his game uh, due to another project that didn't go over so well. And they were like, this is never gonna earn us money, so they scrapped the game. Um, we were able to, we had Brian out for an event and he just started talking about this game called Spectre Files. And uh, I, I just could not believe what I was hearing. Uh, he showed me a video online of the, the trailer that he had made 15 years ago for it with this lost title. Um, and it looked like a really interesting game and the collector side of me was like, wow, that, what if, what if I, I, it's unfortunate that nobody ever got to play this. So I really kept pushing him and being like, what do you, what do you remember about this game? And after 20 some years, it's 1984, so longer than that, um, he didn't remember much. And he's, he one day was like, after talking about bringing it up four or five times to him, he was like, you know, may, I might have the video, the 16 millimeter film still somewhere. And I'm like, well, what if, what if we do this? If uh, you find that, we'll team up with Galping Ghost Productions and we'll, we'll finish this game after 30 plus years. And not really thinking about it, he was like, yeah, yeah for sure. And uh, a couple of weeks later, I get a phone call and he's like, you know, I was out in the garage and I actually found that video. And he's like, I don't know if there's, it's, the tin, it's tins, it's all these tins of 16 millimeter film. I don't know if it's any good. Uh, but we can go have it looked at. And uh, it, it, we just progressed with it. And after about eight months, uh, everything lined up, and uh, now we, we actually have it here. We have Spectre Files, The Death Stalkers, unfinished game from 1984 that's now been completed. And uh, it's, we've had it on the arcade floor. We put it out uh, last Halloween. And uh, the response to it has just been tremendous. And it was a game, back in the day, it, it never would have earned money and would not have been, it might have been well received, because it's, it's, it's funny, you can see Brian's humor throughout the game. But uh, it wouldn't, the average game would take 15 minutes to play, so it definitely wouldn't have earned and it never would have been greenlit back then. But it's just one of those things that it's, it's a tremendous, feeling to be able to bring a game from uh, one of these legendary creators and put it out in front of people and then be able to turn around and show that creator that what they did so long ago is it still has like tremendous value. Um, and that's happened with so many games. Brian has donated uh, RC Squared, which was another uh, one of one prototype, an international team laser, another one of, also a one of one prototype. Um, we've been very fortunate enough to work with Jeff Lee on several games, uh, Argus and Arena, and he helped us complete those games uh, and created new artwork for the cabinets. And it's always been to me, um, when I, from the production side, working with Galloping Pro Ghost Productions, it's these guys are 
just legends within this industry, and it's so been so unfortunate that no more people don't recognize them and give them the just due credit. Uh, back when these games were coming out, they were such a valued commodity that they wouldn't even let their the developers wouldn't even let them put their names on the game for fear that other teams would steal their artists or programmers away. So so many of the uh, credit, like nobody knew who worked on these games, and that was kind of like this industry secret thing. And the detrimental thing is it kept the artists from ever really getting their just, just due accolades. And that's one of the most satisfying things for me is to promote the industry people and uh, finally make them household names after all these years for their creations that 30 years ago, every, all of us here had been playing these games and enjoying them and getting, uh, that's what, what, what most of us did. And 30 years later, I see those same people bringing their kids into the arcade and perpetuating the whole cycle. And these games really are timeless. Um, and it's great to see the artists and creators finally get, get that, the accolades. And I uh, hope that that continues. And uh, that's definitely some of the favorite and most memorable events as for me because obviously as a guy who works from the production side, it's always been, why aren't these people known? And it's so instantaneous when um, we've done these events. And for us, we all know these guys. So it's like, oh, here's, here's Jeff Lee. And people are like, oh, who? He, he's the artist on Qbert. He created Qbert. And then you see it, it, just the smile on those people's faces. It's like, wow. Every, and it's, it's the same thing every time. It's funny. It's like, wow, I spent so much money playing your game. And it's, it's like, it's, that, it's always been that missing piece. And it's amazing, and it's such a great thing. Again, with, with shows like this at, at Pinball Expo, um, to have those people here, and sharing their stories, and it's just that forgotten side. So when you do see those people here, please make sure that they get your the the deserved gratitude because they've uh, made made the whole industry, both video and pinball side. So um, actually, I I think uh, we would open it up. Uh, if there's are there any questions about anything? Uh, we have about 270 video games in storage right now. Um, that number is, it goes up every week. Uh, we keep, we've, I was trying to keep it balanced at about having 200 uh, in the vaults. And the goal was to put a game on the floor every Monday. And that should have kept the, everything right at the 200 and back up for whenever we were able to expand. And that is, we've never been able to really keep up with being at 200. So uh, we do a new game every Monday uh, at 5 p.m. Uh, we've done that for going on three years now. Um, it's always a surprise. We don't tell anybody what it's going to be. We have a live stream on Twitch and our Facebook channel. So definitely, if uh, you're interested, tune in and join us. And uh, we always try to put out something really special and unique. And uh, we have. There's players that turn out every week for it. So after the unveiling, we get to watch a direct stream video of the actual game and see some great players play some really cool, rare games. So. We, we've Actually, and one of the big things that we want to announce is uh, we are expanding right now. Um, we are, we just knocked down the wall into our fourth building. Um, this will be our largest expansion to date. Over the last uh, few months, we've had to pull, as we were putting new games on the floor for Monday Mystery, we've had to pull a few off. So there's about 30 or 40 machines off the floor right now. And those will all be coming back with the expansion. Uh, we should have room for about 200 and around 220 more games in that new building. Uh, so we'll be creeping up on a thousand. Probably won't make it with this expansion, but there is two more. There's technically 
four more expansions that we can do in that building. We'll have the entire block, um, which we'll, we would probably, as we get them, we'll fill it pretty quickly. Uh, we've already been in talks about putting on a second floor. Um, and at that point, we should be all right, I would hope. Uh, it, it's definitely getting harder and harder to find games to purchase just because there's, there's so many that we have in storage. And uh, so we, we should be good for a while and very excited for the new expansion. And if we're going to be making uh, a big event out of that, um, it'll definitely be we have a big Mortal Kombat event called Shang Tsung's Fight Night where we have uh, a lot of the actors from the original three Mortal Kombat games coming out. So we definitely want to invite everybody to that. Um, they'll be signing autographs and taking pictures. And that's our annual event that we run. And uh, it will be in the expansion area, all the signings and everything. And then um, once that's done, we'll do our readjustment of the arcade floor. We want to make it a little bit more comfortable for everybody. So there'll be everything is getting going to get switched around. and. Uh, make a little bit more space within the aisles and everything. So, But um, we have thought about doing second locations before. Um, it would be difficult. Uh, for us, we always, we always want to outdo ourselves. And uh, it would be difficult to outdo that collection of games. Um, we've had requests, open one in California, open one in New York. and um, That would be cool. But I don't, I don't feel this one's done yet. So until then, we'll probably stay where we are. Uh, and again, continue to help all these other arcades open. So, but it is something we think about. They definitely wouldn't. Uh, there is, uh, there's probably around 20 one of one games. Um, we've got, uh, there's an arcade tracker called Orcade.com, and we purchased them about going on a little over a year ago now. Um, we've got about four, uh, well, I would say at least 200 machines that we're the only arcade that has them worldwide that's according to this tracker. And we've tried to be pretty thorough. Uh, obviously, there's arcades that don't list their machines, but uh, there's definitely a lot of unique games there. Um, and that's just been from importing games from Japan and uh, Again, talking to the developers and everything. So it would be hard to replicate, but it, eventually it might be fun to try. Well, in the the preservation of them, it's it's that in itself is a we get calls about that all the time. Um, so many of the people want them um, like the games uploaded to Mame, and it, it's like so everybody can play them everywhere. And a lot of that isn't when we get the games. Uh, we usually leave that up to the source that we get them from. Um, we make sure that everything is preserved. We recently opened uh, up Galloping Ghost Reproductions, which focuses on reproducing um, arcade and pinball artwork. Uh, so we, we meticulously scan everything and get all the um, exact color values and make sure that the game is as preserved as possible. Uh, stuff like backing up the, RAM or the, the ROMs and everything, that's simple enough to do. Um, Depending on the game itself, like um, the game Arena, an amazing Gottlieb game. Um, while the ROMs are specific, uh, the board is a pretty much standard Gottlieb board. So once the ROMs have been preserved, even if that board uh, was damaged, we could recreate it. Um, so preservation is definitely very important, not necessarily as much as making it publicly playable, um, in which we have done, but like it's, it, preservation is key. And the, just because we never know what is going to happen to any of these boards. So it's, uh, 
self-preservation as well as we want to keep them available to uh, everybody to enjoy at the arcade. Thank you. Honestly, no. Um, there's several machines that have not changed their location in eight years. Um, it's we do occasionally, like with Monday Mysteries, it's pretty much due to the layout at this point is just uh, wherever this game can go, that's where it's going. Um, we like to group stuff by, like we have an amazing Williams row. Uh, I'm very proud of our Williams row. We've got all of our Mortal Kombat games grouped together. And there's, it's really, the layout for us it doesn't matter as much where they are as it allows us to um, have customer, like the player engagement is so important because they know the games that they're looking for. And like somebody might be on Burger Time and we don't have, currently we don't have Burger Time and Super Burger Time side by side. And the reason is so we can go talk to people and be like, you see somebody playing Burger Time, you go up to them and you're like, hey, you, you've been on this for a bit. Do you know that there's a Super Burger Time? And then you get to take a walk with them and pass other games and point them out. Because there's so many games that most of these people have never played. And one of the big things that I looked at uh, when we were opening is why I played the games that I played. And it was, it was never really about... Um, like, there was the initial draw to a game. Like, I, Double Dragon, Golden Axe, Altered Beast. Um, I would play them every time. And because I was paying with quarters, that, that was what made me, if there's a new game, even if I was interested in playing it, I wanted to play the stuff that I knew I liked. And that's what the free play model, back when we were opening, there, there weren't any free play arcades. It was like, that was what made it, hey, this is going to change things. This is going to make it so that it's not about dropping the, the quarter anymore. It, it changes the psychology of it in the fact that you, c you can play anything. And if you don't like it, you walk away and you've not lost anything. And there's still so many people. I, I feel so bad. Like the, the games that we consider casual games, like the drivers and light gun games, that section, we call it the casual section, and it's where everybody is there. Like, everybody's playing. So going back there and telling people, like, oh, you know, this is a one-of-one one game. You should come over and check this out. That's, that's been the big secret. It's like when uh, another thing I looked at, when I went to an arcade growing up, I never talked to anyone in the decades that I was going. I never talked to an arcade employee. They never had any interaction with me. And it was like, wow, that's a big shame because there's so many amazing stories behind each one. And that's what ch can change the casual player into a ha like the hardcore player. And we've, we've seen it happen so many times, especially with uh, scoring on games. Uh, you see somebody who's uh, just playing a game and they're they're good at it and it's like oh yeah you know you're on on orcade as it it grew it turned into a scoring house as well so it was like wow you're you'd be in eighth place if you submit this score and you, you explain the whole thing to them and in that they get hooked on it and they like wow I bet I can get seventh and you can the most interesting thing has been taking games that nobody has ever heard of. Uh, for example, there's a game, uh, I saw it on auction in Japan, and it was $10. And it was called Yuchuyu Daisuko-san Choco Vader Contact D. And it's this weird mini puzzle game, like just a bunch of small games that you play. And it had 
really interesting artwork, um, kind of like a 50s style to it. And it was all about like aliens and just these weird, cool mini games. And I was like, 10 bucks. I'll, I'll try it for 10 bucks. Had it shipped in, played it, and I was like, wow, this is absolutely amazing. It's made in 2002 by Namco. So at that time, I, the uh, executive vice president of Namco, I, I, he was opening up uh, level 257 out in Schaumburg. And I started talking to him about it. And he's like, oh, I've never even heard of that game. I'm like, really? It's really awesome. And he's like, you should have one here at 257. Like, I, I wouldn't even, I don't have one and I don't know where I would even get one. It would have to be brought in from Japan. So I went back and I'm like, man, I was like, everybody should be playing this game. We ran it in a tournament. There was these people from Canada that just absolutely loved it. And uh, they came back after the tournament just to play this game. And I was like, wow, this is something that, how cool is that, that people are getting into this game. It's been out for 15 years and nobody's ever seen it or heard of it. So I went online and I found the guy had like 10 more boards for $10 each. So I bought them all. And I gave one to Namco. I gave one to this guy from Canada. I gave um, one to Underground. I gave them to all these arcades. And now there's like 10 arcades that have Yuchuyu, Daisuka-san, Choco Vader, Contactee on it. And it has this weird fan base that people see it, and it's, it's, it's hidden off in the back corner, but we get people that come in, and they are, they're asking for it. And it's like, wow, that's, that's awesome that you can take a game and make it have relevance and presence 15 years after it came out and put it in front of the people and make it interesting to them, and they'll play it. It's, so it's like, the, getting back to the, I'm sorry for my long roundabout answering the question. It's like to us, the, the location of the games is less important because we want to be taking them where we want to be taking them. Uh, there are some times where, again, space, you, we don't, there's, the space is dictated that we don't have every game where we want it out of it all making sense but with the expansion, we should be able to reorganize quite a bit and get everything displayed better than it's ever been. So we're very excited for that. It's, we have our regulars, it's been surprising how much they actually enjoy it because they go back looking for the game that they know where it's at and they go and it's like oh oh yeah I wanted to play this game too and it's same thing it, they end up asking where it is sometimes especially with um, most of the regulars are all there on Monday and they play whatever the last game was and they play the new game so it's astonishing how quickly um, they want to know where it is and they'll go to it. And that puts them in a different section. So when they're playing, collectively playing a game, uh, they, they are playing the games around it too. Uh, like the groups will come and be like, oh yeah, I haven't played this in a long time. Um, with so many games, uh, like there is our, our first world record was set in 2011. And it was actually a situation just like that that got some of our regulars uh, back playing it in 2016. And the skill level of the players had increased so much, it went from back in 2011, one player broke a world record that stood since 1984. But when all of them went back to it in 2016, like nine of our guys had e ellipsed what was the world record in 84. So it, well, it, it can at times, they, they walk in and they're like, oh, you moved this, where is it? Um, it? It's never that much of an issue. And in more, most instances, it's a, a benefit to them. So. The, the newer arcade games are coming out. Um, we've definitely been... Uh, like very, we 
get games in from Japan boards at least very regularly. The games in Japan right now have become a little problematic because so many of them are server-based. And if you can't connect to the server, you don't get to play the game. Um, there's, uh, most of the time now, there, the newer stuff is actually, you download it to the server, and when the company doesn't want you to have it anymore, they pull it back and it's just gone, which is a very unfortunate thing. Um, currently, we've got uh, our newest stuff, our newest games, uh, Castlevania, uh, the arcade game, which uh, great game from Konami, Metal Gear Solid, um, Silent Hill, and uh, Left 4 Dead, which came out in 2014. So we do like getting some of the newer stuff. Uh, there are great games coming out from like Raw Thrills and Play Mechanics still. Um, because those are so prevalent at other, like Dave and & Buster's and places like that, they don't, we don't really have them in our place yet. Uh, also due to costs, like the costs are so high. Uh, but it doesn't mean that eventually we, we wouldn't acquire them and have them on, as part of the arcade floor. So. Oh, was that uh, John's Arcade? I believe so. We, we do a walk-around video, and I remember our first walk-around video was about, it was like half an hour long. And everybody's like, wow, that's a long walk-around video. Thank you. Our, our last full walk-around video was about, it was like over two hours. And after this next expansion, it'll probably be a three and a half hour. And I, I prattle on and on about this stuff. So it's like I've, each cabinet, I remember where I got it. And so I, I love the stuff. And I, I understand that people fast forward through a lot of it. <laughs> Uh, the future of pinball at Gallop and Ghost is, uh, and we, we have said we were going to be making a big pinball announcement. Um, we had our most had um, about nine pins on the arcade floor at one time, and it was so problematic to keep pinball running. Um, about two months ago, we were down having four pins on the arcade floor. And what would happen is, so many people would come and play them. Uh, our busiest Saturday that we've had, we've had 896 people in in a single day. So the pins get played nonstop. Uh, one will go down, and then it just kind of collapses on itself. So what we've decided to do is open our own Galloping Ghost Pinball building, which will be two blocks east of the actual arcade. Uh, we hope to have that. We're going to open a temporary location to start with. Uh, and probably open with about 25 to 30 machines. Um, that building can, we hope to have around 40 fairly quickly. But uh, we've been pretty selective what, with what we've got, and we will be making on Monday, we're going to be showing and uh, making the official announcement of what machines we have uh, already and let everybody know what we're going to be getting as well. So. Well, we might not be uh, with the, our, the video game side where we are the largest arcade in the world and we might not be that with, with pinball, but we hope to be running a ton of really cool tournaments. We hope to have a lot of industry people out and uh, do pretty much the same thing that we did with video games with pinball. So we thought this was an excellent place to, to officially announce it. So. Oh. Also, uh, we've got about 60 arcade machines here. Uh, and we will be running on Saturday the Pinball Expo Tournament Championship, where uh, it's going to be starting at 10 a.m. and going till 6. And uh, the winner will be receiving this belt, and we'll have some other cool prizes as well. So I uh, hope everybody who's interested comes and competes in the 10-game uh, tournament. But I assume Rob is here as uh, we're running short on time. So thank you, everybody. If anybody has any other questions, thank you. Thank you very much.